Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today in this episode, I will finally tackle Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Now, I had not recorded anything on Things Fall Apart primarily because, you know, this is one of the most canonized African novels, and there is so much material already available. So I thought, you know, recording another lecture on it would be sort of redundant because people can always look up what is available and inform themselves. But after reviewing quite a few videos and lectures, I realized that there is a, a f there are a few things about the novel that are not being said, at least in the public domain. And I thought maybe I should record a conversation about the novel, not necessarily explaining its plot and characters because that is already readily available. So what I'll do uh, in today's episode is talk about certain things specific that we ought to keep in mind as we read the novel and especially as we try to decipher Okonoko's character and his actions. So that's what I will primarily be focusing on. So even before we go into discussing the novel, it is important, in my opinion, to consider Chinua Achebe's own positionality and then think a little bit of what kind of a novel is he writing. So if you look at the African writing tradition, of course Chinua Achebe is a towering figure. But by and large, there are two major camps in African writing. So people led by Chenwa Achebe are the ones who believe that the colonization notwithstanding the languages that colonizers left, English or French, are, and I'm quoting Achebe here, are a gift, and that we should be not hesitant in using it, right? So that commitment to English language and then English culture that the colonizers left. On the other hand are people like Ngugi Tiango, Chinwe Zhu, and others who absolutely believe that it is essential for African writers to tell their own stories in their own languages. And if you go by Chinwe Zhu, the purpose should be to retrieve the lost African culture and re-articulate it in modern times. Right, so that's the divide. So within that, Achebe thinks that English is a gift and has no qualms in writing most of his works in that language. And the other thing to keep in mind is as to what kind of a novel is it, formalistically speaking. This is not a plot-driven novel. This is a character-driven novel, okay? So any novel that's a character-driven novel then mostly focuses on the inner thoughts or external actions of one main protagonist or at the most two. So we have to keep in mind that this is a character-driven novel and the main character about whom the story is is a chronicle, right? And that's a choice that Achebe makes, in my opinion, because he knows what kind of a story he wants to tell. Now, what he doesn't want to tell, what he doesn't want to write, and it's obvious in the story, is the story of the magical African man, or the story of an uncomplicated native native culture in which everything was peaceful and there were no contradictions or problems. The novel that he's writing is about an individual character, okay? And an individual who is not necessarily over-determined by his culture. Most of the times, of course, he is transgressing that culture. An individual who has a slightly archaic sense of what constitutes masculinity and that belief system puts him in trouble with the living culture in which he exists. So that's really crucial to keep in mind. And through Okwanako, then, he is telling an African story, but a story that would also translate well in the West. 
because how many times have we read a novel where a male character has problems with his masculinity is fighting these demons of the memory of his father, doesn't want to be like his father. So in that sense, it is quint quintessentially a realistic novel that could have been set anywhere in the world. And that, in my opinion, is intentional. And the reason I suggest that is because if you read Achebe's speech, which he gives years later about Conrad, what he's trying to assert in that speech is that the way Africa is represented, first of all, Africans don't speak in the novel, but Africa itself is represented as this menacing, dark place, right? So what he does in the novel, even though he politically talks about it later, is gives us a story in which an African character is the main character. And he doesn't give us an idealized African character. He gives us a flawed character, which you will expect in any normal novel as well. And then the novel is about tracing the accidental, the individual choices, and the larger colonial and cultural determinants that drive the actions of this hero. But by and large, most of the things that happen to Quanaco are the things that are either a result of his own choices or actions, often accident, sometimes accidental, but mostly it's about the choices that he makes. And the reason I also want to assert this point that this is the story that tells the story of an African character who is individualistic and has his own view of what constitutes being a man or masculinity. And that becomes obvious from the very start of the novel. If you read the first sentence, it says, Okonoko was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. So here is a novel set in Igbo land where we are given glimpses into a living culture which is collectivist in so many ways. The story that Achebe is telling us is not of the culture itself. It's not driven by the pulls and pressures of that culture. It's the story of a self-made man, right? And that's crucial to understand because that's crucial to Achebe's project that Africans should be able to be participants in their stories, and they should be treated as individual characters capable of making right or wrong choices, right? And I think in that sense, Things Fall Apart is a great example of how to write an African, an Asian, a Caribbean novel, right? Which doesn't just tell us the culture or history of that, but also tells us about characters who make choices, who transgress, who are complex. Some aspects of them are likable. But by and large, things fall apart is the story of a tragic male protagonist, right? It's a tragic story because it shows his rise. It shares with us his weaknesses, his transgressions, his fight with others and with himself and with the memory of his father and eventually his fall. And that fall is connected to his own pride, but also that the values that he accepts, expects from his tribesmen have already been altered and he has this view of his own place in a culture that has already passed the stage. You know, in so many ways, Okonoko's idea of self-culture, valor, and fighting is based in, in, in a time frame even within his own culture that has passed, right? And these are some of the important things to keep in mind as we think about Okonoko and his actions, and that would help us understand the novel better. So another thing that emphasizes this idea that a lot of things that Okonoko does 
in the novel or his actions or his behavior is an aberration and not necessarily a representation of the entire Igbo culture is because so many times he transgresses the norms of his own culture. But also his friend Oberaika, right, who is sort of the voice of reason in the novel. And he gives us the opposing point of view, a more moderate point of view, a more rational point of view to Okwanako's aggression and hypermasculinity. And that is why I, I strongly encourage my students to not read Okonoko as a representation of his entire culture, but as an aberration, as someone who makes a choice to be the kind of masculinity that he inhabits, to be the kind of man. And his idea of manhood comes from a deep insecurity about his father, right? And this idea of aligning or assigning ineptitude and failure to someone who's artistic and who cannot hold a job is not necessarily just African, right? It is very Victorian, right? It's deeply built in the image of European sense of self, productivity, holding a job, being a provider are still considered values, right, where we consider, oh, this is a reliable man, right? And if you're slightly dreamy and, you know, not very well organized, people would still consider you a loser. So it's not necessarily just the African mode of viewing the world. It is something that could be slightly universalized, right? So deep down, O'Connor's idea of assigning value to a certain masculine identity is not just his idea, it is also a deeply utilitarian idea. And a lot of people miss that point. He's an individual, he's a flawed individual, and because of his insecurity about his father and his father's so-called disgraced place within the hierarchy of the culture, Kwanako, through his physical prowess, has decided he is not going to be like his father. He's going to excel. He's going to have the biggest compound. He's going to be strong, right? And he is not going to show his emotions. So the hyper-masculinity that he adopts is deeply dependent on this or, or constituted through this anxiety, and then most of his effort throughout the novel is spent on maintaining that created, constituted hypermasculinity. Right? That is why pretty much all the actions, other than one accidental action, because of which he gets exiled, are destructive and self-destructive, because he has this deep idea of performing this masculinist identity and even towards the end right where he kills one messenger and then expects all his tribesmen to follow him into battle is kind of based in this idea that we are men this is what we ought to do so in so many ways then uh, i encourage my students to read the novel as an African novel, because the no novel teaches us so much about the Igbo culture, its customs, its traditions, but it also teaches us that even within that culture, people like Obraika and others are questioning certain assumptions, certain practices, right? So we ought to read that. And within that, the way Okwanako creates his own masculinity and his identity needs to be read as, as an individualistic choice, maybe based in psychological trauma, and not necessarily as a, as a natural outcome of being born in the Igbo tribe. Right? That's really crucial to keep in mind. Beyond that, of course, another important aspect of the novel is the encroachment of the colonial powers. And so in the last section, then I'll talk about the Christian missionaries, the British administration, and especially the last, the ending of the novel, right, which uh, a lot of people miss, but I think it's crucial to spend a little bit of time on that. So before I go to the ending of the novel, 
uh, I would I forgot to mention, you know, the title, of course, comes from William Butler Yeats's poem, The Second Coming. And it is inscribed in the beginning of the novel. And it's important to keep that in mind, too. And that is turning and turning in the widening gyre or gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And the next lines are what? rough beast, its hour finally come, marches towards, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born, right? Now, do keep in mind that a gyre or a gyre in um, Yates is a funnel-like structure, right, which is widening and widening, and it, it, it constitutes a millennia. And that falcon, falcon cannot hear the falconer is the flight of the falcon away into, into the widening gyre, right? And that is the moment when one millennia is ending, the center cannot hold, things fall apart, and the new millennia will start. So keep that in mind that the novel's ending could be read as that one time frame has ended you know, things have fallen apart, but a new time frame is emerging, right? But by the end of the novel, we know that Quanaco has done the most unthinkable thing. He has, you know, hanged himself. He has committed suicide, which is an absolute taboo in the Igbo culture, to a point that his own tribes people can't even bury him or give him the burial rituals, right? But then interestingly, after we are told about that tragedy, we are now in the mind of the commissioner, right? So the British have come in. First, they sent in the missionaries, right? The missionaries came. They converted all those who were excluded from the tribal hierarchy. And so that conflict shows up in Okonoko's own life, where his son converts to Christianity, right? And that's another failure that he sees in, in his own son, right? And then the missionaries, and that's where the fight happens, right? You know, it's the fight with the missionaries. And then the British have already come in and established their courts, established their police stations, and started implementing their law. So a new order has already emerged on the fringes of Igbo culture, of which a lot of people are aware. But a Kwanako, you know, is in open revolt against that because he still believes of his rehabilitating himself within the tribal customs and leading, you know, his clan. So those come into clash, right? So when they are arrested and humiliated and when he kills the messenger, there are only two options, right? They either fight and to do that he needs the support of his tribesmen. And when that doesn't materialize, he kills himself, right? Now we have just finished reading the story of rise and fall, love and hate, mistakes and successes of this monumental character called Okonoko. He has become live to us, right? But the ending that Achebe writes in a way tells us how the British viewed these things, right? How this was so insignificant in their master plan, right? The commissioner went away taking three or four of the soldiers with him. In the many years in which he had toiled to bring civilization to different parts of Africa, he had learned a number of things. One of them was that a district commissioner must never attend to such undignified details as cutting a hangman from the tree, right? Such attention would give the natives a poor opinion of him. In the book which he planned to write, he would stress that point. As he walked back to the court, he thought about that book. Every day brought him some new material. The story of this man who had killed a messenger and hanged himself would make interesting reading. One could almost write a whole chapter on him. Perhaps not a whole chapter, but a reasonable paragraph at any rate. There was so much else to include, and one must be firm in cutting out details. He had already chosen the title of the book after much thought. 
the pacification of the primitive tribes of the lower Niger. Right? These are the ending lines of the novel, right? And why is it there? I mean, haven't you ever asked yourself, right? I think it's there to point to us that despite the fact that this person, this is how the British saw the natives, as footnotes, right, as things that were inconsequential. And so here he is, this British commissioner, but also someone who's writing about these experiences, who's recording the Igbo tribes, right? And so he is seeing it as a pacification project. But this life full lived with it, ups and downs and tragedies that we have just read in the consciousness of this British officer who plans to write a book about nature, about this region, this might even just qualify as a passage, right? And so in a way then Achebe, after telling us this story riven by, you know, intrigue and passions of this man, a man whom we get to know as we read the novel very well. We know his backstory, we know his actions. It's also then, by the, by the ending, it's driven home to us that there are so many such lives that were considered insignificant not worthy of attention and maybe worthy of one note here and one note there and that is the problem of colonial representation of native culture so just at the moment where Achebe has given us a representation of the life of a living thriving tragic character he's also then teaching us how this story will appear or may not appear in the British Chronicles in their recording of the life of Oconoco. So these are some of my thoughts about the novel. Um, I have covered in this that we should not re, uh, read the novel or any post-colonial or African novel as having the capacity to carry the burden of an entire culture. We should not read it as a novel that teaches us everything about Africa. We certainly cannot read Okonoko as a stand-in for every Igbo man, right? And we have to read him as a character who makes certain individual choices. Some may be determined by the customs of the culture that he lives in, but mostly in transgression of those customs, mostly driven by his own excessive pride, his anxiety about not being taken as his father, Right? and his belief in a hyper-imperfect masculinity. And I think that is what Achebe intended to do in the novel, and that is what he wanted to represent. And I think that is what made the novel also successful, that it was set in Africa, but by and large, if you read it, even though it is the novel is imbued with native proverbs, native wisdom stories, the story as it's driven from point A to B in its plot could very easily be understood by any English or other American reader accustomed to the novelistic form. And I think that was the brilliance of this technique that you know, Achebe masters in his writing. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening to me. For your support and if you have any questions please send them my way through the comments and i am deeply grateful for your presence in my life and i will now be back with something new maybe another lecture about chenua chebe but until then take care stay safe and as always peace and love